welcome to another episode of Raising the Bar with myself, John Cooper. And today I have a very special guest. I have Michael Speth. How are you doing, Michael? Yeah, doing pretty well. Um, I am really excited for this because, uh, you know, we got in contact. You told me that you had a very interesting message that's contrary to the mainstream narrative. And it's about what's topical at the moment. It's about viruses. And, uh, you know, you, you, you've put forward this, uh, you know, this proposal for this presentation. And I'm really keen to uh, see it and for our audience to see it. So I'm going to ask the question today, does SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 exist? And when I say SARS-CoV-2, that is the alleged virus. And COVID-19 is the alleged disease caused by the virus. So before we get into a virus, let's look at what COVID-19 is according to the World Health Organization. So COVID-19, again, is the disease. And WHO lists uh, common symptoms of it as being fever, dry cough, and fatigue. And I don't know about you, John, but I've had all of these symptoms at one time or another in my life. Yeah, this, uh, this just sounds like a, a hangover to me. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have these uh, less common symptoms where loss of taste or smell. And if you've ever had a stuffy nose, like, of course, food doesn't taste as well. It's hard to smell because your nose is stuffed up. And then they say nasal congestion, red eyes, sore throat, headache, muscle or joint pain, skin rash, diarrhea, chills, or dizziness. I mean, they're really covering off all the, the, the different ailments we have as humans. Mm. So going into severe COVID, they say it's shortness of breath, loss of appetite, confusion, chest pain, and high temperature. And again, these are symptoms that I know I've experienced in my life. My kids have had them. Um, I think pretty much all humans have had these symptoms at one time or another. And then they also list some severe, less common, which is irritability, confusion, anxiety, depression even, and more. Um, so I think what we can say is that none of these symptoms are specific to COVID. I mean, if you have any of these, you can't say, oh, I've got COVID. I mean, you could have any, anything. Let's move on to what a virus is um, described by virologists. So virologists will say viruses are very, very small, uh, smaller than cells. They invade the body. So they come outside the, from the body and, and come in. Um, they're not living. So when they, when they say they're not living, they, do, they can't reproduce on their own. So they have to take over cell machinery. And they'll also say that they make you sick. And I have a question mark there because uh, I believe the science doesn't actually prove that. And then finally, the name of the virus is the SARS-CoV-2, as I mentioned before. And here's just a simplified diagram of what virologists say the virus looks like. So there's these spike proteins on the end. You've probably seen them in like 3D graphics that are all high res. There's an envelope, which is the membrane, which contains the RNA, single-stranded RNA. So what we want to do is look at how do we prove that, say, a virus exists. And the thing that we need to do is isolate it or purify it, separate it out from all the other genetic uh, material. And what I want to do is explain why that's important. So isolating a virus, if we have an isolated virus, then we can do valid experiments on it, like figuring out what DNA it has, maybe what shape it has, um, the type of behavior it might exhibit. And to do this, we're going to have an analogy. I'm showing you on the right-hand side a picture of all these different animals. Um, and I, I want to show it so that you can kind of visualize what I'm talking about in a more simplified form. And with this picture, we know that there's a bunch of animals in it. And we're trying to isolate out an alleged rat. So we have a little question mark over these rats. And we're simply just trying to figure out um, are these rats, do these rats exist? So we start off with a bunch of different animals. And imagine they're really small and they're hard to see. So the way we would isolate it is we simply remove those alleged rats from everything else. So we don't care about this. We just want to have a sample of only alleged rats. And that is isolation. 
And I think most people would assume this is what they would have done in the scientific papers. What about you, John? Do you think this makes sense? Like, is this yeah, how you would see it? Yeah, isolation? definitely. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly how I would see it. You just, it's, it's just extrapolating the actual thing that you're looking for. I mean, that, that's just straightforward to me. So I, I went and looked, started looking at the scientific papers and started reading them. And as I was reading them, they weren't doing that, those basic steps. They were doing something else. And so that got me interested in thinking, well, if the scientific papers aren't telling me they're isolating it, what about just directly asking the big scientific organizations? So I started here in New Zealand with the Ministry of Health. And this is the question that I asked the Ministry of Health. I'm just going to summarize it. Basically, I asked the ministry, do you have any records for the isolation of SARS-CoV-2 virus? And their response, which was given in August of this year, they said, we do not hold records that describe the isolation of a SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, this is shocking. Like, I was just floored when I received this response. I thought surely the Ministry of Health would have isolated the virus because they're, lock they're the ones who are responsible for locking us down in New Zealand. And I, I just, it was hard for me to believe that initially. So I thought, okay, well, you know, New Zealand's really small. Uh, our Ministry of Health is small compared to other places in the world. So let's go ahead and ask the in England, go, go Science, Public Health England, Department of Health and Social Care. In Australia, I asked the Department of Health, Doherty Institute, which they claim to have isolated the virus. Uh, CSIRO, which is the premier organization in Australia. Outside of the Ministry of Health, I also asked ESR, which is our premier scientific organization. I've asked the University of Otago, which they also claim to have isolated SARS-CoV-2. And then Really, the biggest organization in the entire world, the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I've asked all of them, and they all came back with no records of the isolation of SARS-CoV-2. And for everyone, if you want to read and download the PDFs for all of my requests and responses from these organizations, just go to my website, thevirushoax.net and they're all available for you to read and download on your own. Amazing. But yeah, I, I mean, the C CDC, that, so it was what, August when I asked the Ministry of Health, I asked the CDC around the same time, and I finally got a response in November. So, I mean, this is fairly up to date. Uh, a lot of people will say, oh, but you know, they didn't, they didn't isolate it before, but now it's isolated. Well, guess what, November, I mean, that's pretty, pretty close to where we are now and what? still not a single one isolated. And then what, what was the nature of their, all their responses with it uh, 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 along the same sort of lines or were they saying something, something slightly different in each one or was it just no records in, in those words? Uh, every single one said they have no records. Mm. Uh, in New Zealand, they specifically say they have no records of the isolation. Uh, sometimes they'll say they have no records of the request. <clears throat> which we asked These for. are the papers that claim to have isolated SARS-CoV-2. So if you go to Google and you type in our SARS-CoV-2 isolation, you'll get heaps and heaps of papers. But these papers here are the ones that are generally referenced by all the other scientific papers. And these are the first ones that generally have claimed isolation of SARS-CoV-2. So if you actually download them, there's a link here. You can read them. Go to the methods section and just have a, have a read. There's all heaps and heaps of jargon in these papers. So if you come across a word you don't know, just Google search it. But I believe every single person is capable of reading these papers and so understanding. How, so if, they, if they're all saying that they have isolated it, why are, the, why are they saying that there's no records of it for, from the big institutions, the big health institutions that you contacted? because they're misusing the word isolate. They're, the, these papers are abusing the word isolation. Right. Okay. And so in our request, we specifically define isolation as the separation of a thing from everything else. It's how everyone understands the word isolation. Could you actually, could you just fl flash back to that original um, 
freedom of information uh, there. Yeah, could you just make that clear for us all that w when you're saying isolation, what exactly you're asking for there? You say uh, that second line there, please note that I'm using isolation in the everyday sense of the word, the act of separating a thing, things from everything else. I am not requesting records where isolation of SARS-CoV-2 refers instead to the culturing of something or the performance of an amplification test, i.e. a PCR test, or the sequencing of something. So um, that's where you make it very clear what you mean by isolation, not their wishy-washy um, term. Is that, that's kind of what you're saying, right? And then when you see those articles, if you go back to that uh, slide, these articles where it is claiming uh, there is isolation, they're actually referring to the wishy-washy version, which you're going to explain, aren't you, is about the... Uh, about the, it's, it's, it's the culture, it's not the purification to the, the direct isolation. It's, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll hand that over to you because you're going to explain that, aren't you? That's right. So let's go ahead and dive into what a virologist or what these papers claim isolation is. So again, we start with this same analogy with the, the animals. And here, the alleged rat is going to be the alleged virus. So same thing, you have a bunch of genetic material that they've gotten from a patient. And what they do is they add monkey kidney cells in general. They add some sort of a host cell. And then they add toxic chemicals, antibiotics, antifungals, and fetal bovine serum, which is a contaminant. They add all that together and they call that isolation. Now, John, does mm -hmm. this look like isolation <laughs> of rats to you? I mean, it's the opposite of isolation. It's, uh, you know, a big, a, big, uh, a big house party of everything. <laughs> how, 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 in, how in any, you know, right mind is that isolation? Yeah, I mean, I guess an analogy to this is, you know, if, if they say to isolate at home, have all your buddies and friends over, bring some beer, some smokes. Mm. And then yeah. <laughs> you're isolated just like the, the virologists isolate viruses. <laughs> you know, may, maybe we should do that. Maybe say, look, I'm going to isolate exactly how you isolate the virus, if that's okay. And invite the whole, <laughs> and invite the whole neighborhood down. <laughs> Make sure you have some cat and dogs there as well. Oh, of course. Yeah. And some, uh, some green, green and blue and red potions, maybe some absinthe and some, uh, I don't know, what's the other one they used to have? Yeah. Some uh, aftershock or the other, the other drinks we used to drink when we were young. Uh, throw, <laughs> throw all that in there. And then you get the isolation. Brilliant. <laughs> Crazy. All right. So let's just briefly look at the, uh, how virologists characterize viruses. So they say viruses are really, really, really small. They say they've got these uh, spikes that come out of them. They're single-stranded RNA. They break out of cells, and they're made inside of cells. However... There's also something called exosomes, and they've been introduced into mainstream science about 30 years ago, uh, but the concept has actually been around for perhaps about 100 years. So scientists that study exosomes also characterize them as really, really small. They have spikes that, uh, that are all over them. They have single-stranded RNA. They break out of cells, and they're made inside of cells. So... Can you tell the difference between a virus and exosome? Well, I, I can't uh, I, that. <laughs> yeah. So you might have asked, or you might be thinking, I've seen like a photo that looks like a virus. And these might be in several of the scientific papers. Um, so what's that all about? Are these, because I've seen it, someone sent me a link and they showed me what the virus actually looks like. So on the left-hand side is a EM photo. EM is, stands for electron micrograph. It's basically a, a microscope that can zoom really, really, really far in. And they claim this is the virus. Now, the middle picture is a picture of an extracellular vesicle. It's just something that comes off of cells like cellular debris. And then the right-hand side is an exosome. So all of these pictures look extremely similar, as I was saying before. 
Now you might be asking, well, how do they know that this thing is a virus? And as I mentioned before, it's never been isolated. So when they take this picture, it's a picture of that genetic toxic mess where it's got monkey cells, it's got uh, lots of different human cells, it's got those poisons in it. Um, so what they're doing is they're taking a picture of all that and then they're just finding a few things that they think look like maybe it's a virus. But because they've never isolated it out, they can't say for sure that it is a virus. And some really smart researchers uh, asked each of the, these, the authors who created those papers, and they said, hey, did you isolate those viruses? And the, and the pictures that you took, were they from isolated virus? And every single one of them said no. So for instance, this paper, they said the image is the virus budding from an infected cell. It is not purified virus. Another uh, author wrote, we could not estimate the degree of purification because we do not purify and concentrate the virus cultured in cells. In study three, they said, we did not obtain an electron micrograph showing the degree of purification. And finally, we show an image of sedimented virus particles, not purified ones. So what each of these authors has said is that, look, we took a picture of a bunch of stuff and then we think we found a virus in there. But again, you can't say it's a virus unless you've isolated it out and do valid experiments on it. So going back to exosomes, as I mentioned before, they're, they're being studied heavily. Exosomes are actually isolated and there's valid isolation methods to remove exosomes from everything else. The first method is centrifugation. You just spin it around really, really fast and you can suck out uh, these bands that have exosomes in them. Another method is filtration. So think of it like a coffee filter that's uh, filtering out like the particles and you can, you're just left with exosomes. Precipitation is a chemical process that removes everything else and leaves exosomes. And finally, uh, antibodies, which sort of latch onto exosomes and then they have a way of removing the antibodies once it's collected all the exosomes. And with all of these uh, methods, they will end with looking under a microscope to verify that all they have are exosomes. So I do want to stress that exosomes are isolated and these are the methods they use. And so because I found that exosomes are isolated, I asked the same question, uh, except I replaced SARS-CoV-2 with exosome. So I said, hey, do you have any records of the isolation of human exosomes? And I sent my request to the University of Otago because they have a human anatomy department that works on exosome research. And they responded to me with 331 scientific papers that they claim have isolated or relate to the isolation of, SARS, uh, of human exosomes. Um, and that's what this exactly says. That, um, you know, note that the attached reference may cover a wider scope than your request but we will include as a subset the relevant references and scope of that request. And I know I verified prior to asking them, I looked at one scientific paper that I knew had uh, isolated exosomes from human patients, uh, just like um, I was mentioning before. And that paper turned up in their, in their uh, 331 references. So what this tells me is that SARS-CoV-2 has not been isolated. And the, I, we do have the scientific uh, methods to isolate viruses if they indeed existed. But because no one's doing that, uh, I believe that we can say for sure that SARS-CoV-2 hasn't been isolated. You know that slide where you asked the Freedom Information Act for those different um, uh, medical institutions? Did you say to them, did you ask them to um, provide evidence of an exosome? So 
I've asked a few organizations. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the University of Otago, uh, I sent them that same freedom of information. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, that's how I got this response. But I asked, like, the Ministry of Health, you know, the Ministry of Health isn't studying exosomes. So they, they responded to me, they don't have records. And it's because they, they don't study them. There's no reason for them to be looking at exosomes. Mm. So the, the, you would expect them to have it on virus because they're claiming, hey, viruses exist. And that, that's what's mm. driving their, their whole mandates and directives. But those, like I said, there's no reason for the CDC, for instance, to investigate exosomes because their exosomes are not only um, harmless, they're helpful. Mm. So I didn't mention this before, but I think it's important that everyone knows exosomes are naturally occurring in all life. And every single living cell produces exosomes. And the primary function of exosomes is to remove toxic and garbage from the cell. Mm. So it, it is exosomes are vital to the survival of cells every cell plant cells bug cells animal cells all of it mm. um, the second critical feature of exosomes is that they communicate with other cells so those are the two primary functions and it is theorized that without exosomes our life life would not be possible um, so so yeah um, those, those are the things that exosomes do, but, you know, asking CDC about exosomes is they're not going to have it. They, they don't have interest in, in looking at exosomes. Okay. So, uh, I just want to mention a few people just as for further reference that maybe if you want to discover more about exosomes and viruses and the, the concept of, of viruses, uh, the first one is Dr. Stefan Lanka. He's a virologist, but now just prefers to be called a microbiologist. He won a court case in Germany a few years ago, and the court agreed with him that there was insufficient proof for the measles virus. And this is pretty astounding. Um, I think Dr. Lanka's story is just really interesting. Uh, the next is Andrew Kaufman. He's a well-credentialed medical doctor, and he's the one that first introduced me to the concept of isolation methods. Uh, Dr. Thomas Cohen, he's a medical doctor and he wrote recently released the Contagion Myth book and that describes the whole COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 uh, paradigm that we're living in now. And finally, I want to give huge credit and thanks to Christine Massey. She has a master's of science and she's the one that originally authored the isolation question. So she sent that isolation question to various organizations in Canada. I found her and I uh, collaborated with her to bring that question over to New Zealand and then obviously asking the rest of the, uh, the world. Mm. So I've come to my conclusion section. So based on all of this, SARS-CoV-2 has not been isolated. SARS-CoV-2 has not been proven to exist. SARS-CoV-2 has not been proven to cause disease. And SARS-CoV-2 has not been proven to be contagious. So without SARS-CoV-2 isolates, meaning without isolating SARS-CoV-2, any experiment that anybody does that they claim they are using SARS-CoV-2, like PCR or sequencing or even vaccines, are absolutely meaningless. And so that's kind of where I want to mm. leave this, uh, leave off today. Um, I guess yeah. we can go into a question section. Fantastic. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, it's a real eye-opener. Um, there's certainly lots of things that are um, sort of big question mark on. Um, Mike, do you want to just talk about the PCR tests and um, what they're actually picking up on then? Because I, I would have thought that they were picking up on people that are infectious, but are they not? So a PCR test is only can analyze um, genetic material. So it's, it's designed to amplify genetic material and then look at 
a part of that genetic material. So is that so, actually picking up on exosomes then? Is that what you mean by genetic material? Um, I mean, DNA and RNA. So that's like the insides of a cell or um, inside of an exosome. But mm -hmm. what it cannot do is by looking at the DNA, you can't go back and say, oh, this is an exosome or this is a alleged virus or this is a human cell. Because every, everything, every life form has DNA and it's extremely long, like thousands and thousands of, uh, of, of uh, pairs. Um, so every, every organism is gonna have some, some combination of pair that you're looking at. Um, so it's, it's just not possible to go back and say, well, I found this particular sequence, therefore I have to have this thing in present in my sample. Um, the other thing about PCR is it destroys the things in the sample to begin with. So if you put a cell in, in PCR, it destroys the cell and all you're left with is with the genetic material. So again, like at the end result, you, you can't take that and say, well, I can do something with it. Like you, you're not growing virus, you're not growing bacteria, you're not growing cells. You've destroyed the, the cell, you destroyed any mechanism of being able to reproduce the thing. And they're claiming so, that's the infected cell, but it's actually not. It's just, uh, just parts of DNA, parts of, uh, or I guess antibodies as well, or... Um... Are they picking up on that? It would be anything that has RNA and DNA. Mm. Um, I, I don't actually know if anti this, sorry, I don't know if antibodies have RNA or DNA. Okay. Um, yeah. But so, anything that has RNA or mm, DNA it mm. would uh, be able to replicate. All righty. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that sounds very, very uh, dodgy then what's going on. The fact that people, there's, you know, they're saying thousands of new cases every week. And these are potentially just people that have no, no infection, nothing wrong with them. They're just, it's just picking up on parts of their DNA. Yeah. So the inventor of PCR, his name is Kerry Mollis. Mm. He invented PCR in what, 1985 and won the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1993. So he was a big proponent against the use of PCR for diagnostic um, because he understand, understood the technology, he created it hmm. and said, you cannot claim that people are sick based off of results of PCR. And he also said, you know, if you run PCR long enough, you will find everything. Everything, like he said, everything is sort of contained in us. And so you run this thing long enough and you'll find whatever you're looking for. Mm. And he died last year, didn't he? He did just, just before COVID hit. <laughs> yeah, um, which, is, uh, which is very irritating. As he would have been the, 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 the perfect person to uh, completely uh, blow this apart, what's going on. Um, the other thing I was going to ask then, so the, the argument people would, would have is, but, you know, I know someone that, that got COVID and died. What would be the uh, response to them? Um, first of all, I'm not saying that people aren't dying. Absolutely, people are dying. And I feel very sorry for anybody whose family member has died recently. It's tragic. Um, and I, I, I feel bad. Um, but what we, we can't say that they actually died from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Because as we explained, like SARS-CoV-2 has never been isolated. So there's no way of actually saying a person has this thing or not, mm. um, even though there's claims of it. So what are they dying of then? What, what, you know, what is actually, yeah, what are they dying of if it's not COVID? Um, that's a good question. Um, so we know, so COVID-19 again is the disease and there's heaps of different symptoms. It could be anything, respiratory, uh, fever, or whatever. Um, what I can say for sure is that they're not dying from SARS-CoV-2 because that hasn't been proven to exist. 
Um, what else could they die from? There's a huge host of problems that humans suffer from. I mean, it could be uh, toxic things in the environment like air pollution or poisons. Um, th there can be a lot of different things that people die from. And I, I don't know the person, so I don't know what, what their circumstance was. Um, but we would, we would need to really investigate that individual person to see what went wrong. Okay. But, um, but the, the point is that there's no such thing as viruses in that's the, that's your hypothesis is that there's no viruses at all. Right. So it's not just about SARS. It's also about all viruses, right? You're saying that all viruses don't exist. That's right. Um, I recently sent the same question, the freedom of information question that I sent about SARS-CoV-2 but for all the viruses on the immunization, immunization schedule here in New Zealand. And the Ministry of Health came back and said they also have no records of the isolation of any of those viruses. So that would be like measles, mumps, rubella, wow. um, all of those that are on the vaccination schedule. Um, I've sent out another request from, to ESR and I'm waiting on a response from them. Um, but I suspect it's the same. I mean, I've looked at some of the papers. I know, again, uh, Stefan Lanka uh, brought this about for measles. And there was, there was like six scientific papers that everyone went to that they believed demonstrated measles existed. But the court, the high court ruled in Lanka's favor and said, no, those papers don't provide sufficient evidence to prove the measles virus exists. Yeah, can you? I'd like to know what the truth is on that because I typed in Stefan Lanka and I typed in measles, you know, and the fact that he put out a bet to say, would he? Just can anyone prove it? And when you go through Google, everyone says that he lost. There's not, there's not a retraction of that. What's the latest on that then? What and when did that happen? So the the first court that he went to didn't allow him to have expert witness. The judge basically said, of course, measles exist. Case closed. Oh my god! So he challenged that in the high court. And in the high court, they allowed expert witness and expert testimony. And based off of the scientists that testified, um, they were able to demonstrate there was insufficient evidence. And that was just a few years back. And right. the high court, again, ruled in Lanka's favor that he did not have to pay the 100,000 100, euro to mm -hmm. uh, this uh, scientist. It's funny because you can't find that anywhere if you do a search for it. I do have some links on that. Oh, you do? I, okay. I can pass them to you. Yeah. And also, you know, have put that on your site and um, also drop us the link so people can look into that as well. And that, that's actually, that's massive. I mean, that is, <laughs> that is huge. The fact that that hasn't been, because what, that's like opening a, a can of worms then. It's like, what else isn't uh, real? Um, so w when people are HIV positive, what's actually happening there then, do you think? So this was a, a huge contention from Kerry Mullis, actually. So when Kerry Mullis was trying to write a paper on HIV, the first line in his paper was, does H HIV is the causative agent of AIDS? And in order for him to write that, he needed a reference, a scientific reference that was able to prove it. <clears throat> and he couldn't find it. Like he did internet searching, he, he looked at all of the, the typical places. Mm. And finally, he went and directly asked Montagnier. Montagnier is the person that is supposed, supposedly found this HIV virus. And Montagnier could not provide him that either. So a person that is HIV positive, like there's these antibody tests and they say if they find the specific antibodies that you, you, you have HIV. Um, and it's, it's actually what they're doing now as well. So there's antibody tests for uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so they're not even s saying that the virus exists. What they're saying is your body has some antibodies. <coughs> Sorry, my throat's a little bit dry. Because, I mean, I remember when HIV was, you know, first came about, people were dying of it, like at quite an early age, but then the medicines come about and then people are living quite healthy, a long, healthy life, even with it. So if viruses don't exist, then how is it that medicines are working and are effective? Um, I guess the question is, how do you know they're actually 
keeping people alive. The, the medicines they give for HIV patients mm. are really toxic drugs. Mm. And AIDS pa the HIV patients are extremely ill. Um, I think it would be really good to have studies to show people they claim to have HIV that aren't on the medicines versus people that are. Okay. But, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so, I mean, if we, even if we just don't take HIV, we take something else that, um, you know, a, a, some kind of virus or disease, and then they, someone would take a medicine for it. Um, and so we know that those med some med some medicines do work. Are you saying that like all medicines are ineffective or, or are you saying that some work or none work or what? Um, I don't really know of too many medicines that treat supposed virus i mean generally if you go to the doctor and you have they, they say you have a virus they don't give you anything maybe they give you some penadol like mm. to reduce fever but there's no medicine that actually treats a virus mm. um so yeah i i don't believe again there's no virus there's no medicines that help you get better from a virus Okay, let me just. I, I got some questions here, but um, yeah, because I'm I'm not really the expert on this, so it's kind of like I'm I've I've had to find some questions. Um, yeah, they've just said all the other viruses we faced in the modern day. Explain them and explain why the medicines we made work. HIV, Ebola, influenza, the common cold, hepatitis. Explain how viral drug delivery mechanisms work if there's no virus to deliver them. Um, so I would, I would really question how they know they work. Without isolating those viruses, again, what would the experiment be to prove a, a medicine works? You would have to have an isolated virus mm. and you would have to have like healthy cells. So you would put the isolated virus on healthy cells and then you'd add the medicine and see that the medicine makes the cells recover. But that hasn't happened because they've never isolated the virus. So I, I challenge them claiming that the medicine works. Okay. That's interesting. I mean, that's, uh, that's huge. Um, the other thing they said was, let me just dig this up. Someone that I spoke to said that they, you can see um, viruses under a microscope and you can see the uh, lots of little particles around the infected cells and you can see the cells dying. There's you know, different ways of dying and they shut themselves down or they digest themselves disappearing with no mess or they explode leaving loads of mess everywhere. And he calls that cell lysis or lysis, cell lysis, um, viruses causing cells to explode. So they, they show, they show this. Um, yep. So that question, again, they've never isolated the virus. So when, when they're looking at that sample and taking those electron micrographs, what else is in that sample? Well, it's going to be toxic drugs like antibiotics and antifungals. And it's going to have fetal bovine serum in it. So what is causing the cells to die? My hypothesis is that it's the antibiotics and antifungals. Like anti, those antibiotics that they use are highly toxic. They do not prescribe those antibiotics to people unless they're really, really sick. Right. Generally, okay. those the antibiotics that they're using in, in, the, in these studies, mm -hmm. they're extremely toxic. So I would say that the probable cause of the cell death is these toxic chemicals. But what about like plants have viruses as well, right? Um, well, again, I've, I've never seen any virus uh, isolated, like human viruses isolated. I haven't, I haven't read any scientific papers that claim that plants have also isolated viruses from plants. I've never heard of that. So, okay. Uh, um, I'm just going through. I'll just read what he says here. Vi viral sizes are 20 to 400 nanometers across. Um, 
nano nanometer is one billionth of a meter um and visible light itself has a wavelength of like 300 to 600 nanometers so you just can't use light to see them but you can use beams electrons hence the photo which he showed some smart biochemists have also hacked some virus genomes to add a piece of code that makes a glowing chemical uh, like a, he calls it a fluorescent tag and we can look at look out for the glowing dot when we do that Yeah, don't know if you have any comment, but he's basically trying to say that you can isolate it that way and look at it through a you know a, high, a very high powered um, microscope. I mean, those that's not isolation, right? So the right. the methods for isolating are centrifugation, um, filtration, immunoaffinity, which is the the uh, antibody, and precipitation. So those are the, the ways that you isolate very, 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 very small particles like he was saying 30 nanometers to 400 mm -hmm. nanometers. Um, what he's describing is trying to detect something, mm. um, but detecting it is not the way that you would be able to prove the thing exists outside of everything else. And then having mm. that sample, that purified sample, then you can use that to prove the different characteristics. characteristics mm. right? So for instance, you want, virologists would want to prove that, hey, this thing that we have causes disease. Mm. So you have to set up valid scientific method to prove that, it, it, that this virus causes a disease and you need the isolated virus for that. Okay, all right. Um, so when people, let's say people are getting ill and they're not taking any drugs, you know, people, there was times where people weren't taking any drugs and, and you know, becoming ill. So what exactly is happening there then? You mentioned before about it could be the toxins in the environment. Is it, is, is it uh, limited to that or is there anything else? Oh, lack of nutrients. I mean, mm. throughout human history, we haven't had sufficient nutrients, um, especially as climate has changed. Um, famines were rampant. And when famines happen, disease spikes because your body doesn't have sufficient nutrients to properly grow. So I think probably food is one of the number one reasons people get sick. Um, if you don't, don't have the right nutrients, bad things are going to happen to you. Okay. Um, the yeah. question is why? Um, well, we, we need proper nutrients for, the, for cells to function properly. And if you starve cells, they will, uh, they'll die and they'll, you'll start manifesting uh, illnesses from that. So what we're saying is there's no such thing as uh, contag a, like a contagion, uh, like a, a, a transmissible germ. There's no such thing. Yeah, I think that, that's interesting because China, they have uh, Chinese traditional medicine, about 5,000 years of history. of mm. um, It's a well-defined medical system using traditional medicine. And they never had a concept of contagion. They never considered people were able to make other people sick that wasn't in their in their uh, theory uh, really? and i know yeah they didn't have microscopes or whatever mm. but they never observed contagion in their in their um 5, years of history um so i think there's a lot of uh other uh, medical um practices like from india uh, and the native american medicine they all don't have this concept of contagion really they, they just have if, we need to treat the whole body there's something wrong mm. let's figure out what it is mm. um, and i know with chinese traditional medicine generally it's trying to figure out what you're lacking in nutrients like when they check your body they look at your pulse they look at everything like if your arm's hurting they check everything else because maybe something is causing your yeah. arm to be hurt yeah, they do that in um, acupuncture as well. It's more holistic, isn't it? It's like, you know, see, see the whole organism rather than just the, the organ, let's say. Yeah. Um, what else are I going to say? Um, so, what, so then with the vaccine then, then what the hell is yes. the vaccine doing? <laughs> so I think, I think the vaccine is quite interesting because the way they prove the vaccine works hmm. is exactly the same way 
that they are proving isolation for the virus. Mm. So they'll take, uh, again, they'll take a, a mixture and they, they dump the uh, vaccine into their mixture and then they'll observe uh, cell death and they'll say, oh, our vaccine worked because cells died. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like well you would you would think the proper experiment would be to vaccinate the cells mm. and then drop the virus on the cell to see if the virus kills the cell or not but because they don't isolate the virus they can't do that experiment mm. all they can do is they can they, they claim it's like an immune response so they they want to show that the cells die from the virus because, uh, excuse me, the cells die from the vaccine mm. because they say, well, if, you, if they put the vaccine in a human, your cells are going to die and that's going to create antibodies to whatever toxin they put into. Is that them. right? Is that, are, are they just saying cells are dying because of the vaccine and then somehow that's, uh, is that what they're saying? Because I, I was um, reading the other day that they were saying that all the vaccine does is it doesn't stop you getting a virus and it doesn't stop you transmitting it. <laughs> it just um, stops the the symptoms, which you mentioned in the first slides. I'm saying in in the scientific literature, when yeah. they claim that their vaccine um, prevents a virus, mm. the experiment that they do to prove mm. to allegedly prove that is to demonstrate the cells die from the vaccine. Which and cells? To me, that's so, crazy. Yeah, which cells? <clears throat> They'll say T cells in particular. What's T cells? Uh, I th I think they're they claim to be a part of your immune system, and they claim that they are used to fight against viruses. So they're killing immu <coughs> your immune system, cells connected to your immune system, and that's somehow a victory for the, vo the vaccine. That's right. Yeah, because this, this is say, scandalous. Uh, <laughs> And the other, the other crazy thing is they're not using, I mean, they don't have real virus anyways, but they create synthetic virus mm. is what they call it. And it, what they're injecting in people isn't, isn't the actual, like, it's not a, a virus they extracted from a person. Mm. It's manufactured in a lab. Um, so I, I just find that pretty, pretty crazy. Mm. I'm not an expert on vaccines, by the way. It's just mm. I haven't gone into depth in vaccines like I have with the mm. SARS-CoV-2. So yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just sort of at the base level. Yeah. And excuse me if this is an ignorant question, but SARS-CoV-2 is the, is the virus, the so-called virus, and COVID-19 is the disease. So like, what, what's the difference there? What, I mean, what's the, when they're talking about a disease, what, what, how, yeah, can you explain that to someone that doesn't really, you know, can, I want to get my head around that. Right. So they'll say the disease is just a list of symptoms. Right. So cough, fever, sneezing. And mm. they'll say the virus is causing those symptoms. Right. So one's the input, so the, one's the output of your body. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got you. Got you. Simple as that. Okay. Um, so you are, so you do say that diseases exist. You're just saying that viruses don't exist. That's effectively. Yeah. 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 And I, I do challenge this whole COVID-19 disease because they have so many different symptoms. Mm. To me, it's not unique at all. Like mm. they're just relabeling mm. lots of other symptoms and applying that to COVID-19. Yeah. And the only way, the only way that they can call it COVID-19 is because they claim to have a new virus. Mm. So because they claim to have a new virus, then they invented mm. a new disease. Yeah. And we, we can they're see, very much yeah, we can see that, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're listing people as having a uh, dying of COVID, even if they had underlying health issues. And if they, you know, if they were said to have had it and then fell off a ladder within 28 days, then that gets uh, chalked up as a, a death by COVID, which is very insidious in, in, um, by its very nature there. You know, that's uh, very worrying. Um, and uh, I was speaking to a, a healthcare worker like a nurse and she was telling me that people come in and they get tested multiple times so if they're positive that one person 
if they get you know tested five times that's five cases so that's what inflates the numbers as well so they go in once and they have they get told to keep having the test and you know um, and so that's what inflates the numbers as well so when we hear about you know 10,000 more cases today it's like that could have just been like 100 people and then also the test could also just be picking up on dna so that might, maybe no one's getting it at all so um yeah lots of dodgy business huh yeah w without the pcr um tool mm -hmm. they wouldn't have been able to claim pandemic mm -hmm. You know, it was only because they, they said, well, we have so many cases. Mm. And then at the very beginning, if you remember, there was the Imperial College London that came out with a prediction mm. a, based on a simulation that what, 500,000 yeah. yeah. Britons would die and a million United States people would die. Yeah. <clears throat> and we know that, I mean, that study was absolutely flawed. Mm. And well, Ferguson, that was, wasn't it? Someone Neil Ferguson. Ferguson. Neil Ferguson, yeah. He was also the one that said everyone would die from swine flu, I think. That's right. Yeah. And like, as I'm, I'm a software person, and so, mm. you know, his program that he used to come up with those numbers, you couldn't, if you put the same input in, you would get different output. So the way he worked it mm. is that he would run his simulation a bunch of times and he would just average his output out. Mm. to get to the number that he wanted you know that that's called non-deterministic uh programming and that is not valid it's not valid scientific programming yeah so, i mean he he um i think he got sacked because he was uh you know seeing a, a girl during lockdown or something but his his statistics have improved to be complete bs haven't they um and also do you, i don't know if you remember but do you, do you remember like the early videos of wuhan where they were showing people like dropping dead on the street I don't know if you remember that, but that's how it all started. And so, uh, you know, we heard this thing about people dropping dead in Wuhan and then they flashed up like what they, what they've probably done is just taken loads of CCTV footage of people like, I don't know, just having a heart attack or just drunk and like having, you know, just falling over from like from the last few years, last 10 years and put it all together. And then we, it's like, that's the start of the propaganda, isn't it? And then, um, and now we know that no, that's not happened around the world. Like since then, no one's just dropped dead of having this. Why has no one said, hang on a minute, let's like think about that initial thing in Wuhan? Well, if that's bullshit, then surely that makes you think what else is bullshit. But then but it's almost as if like we've gone to the point of no return now. No one's, no one's kind of willing to sort of look back at that in its origins and sort of really investigate that. But that, when I've looked back on that now, it's just a joke. Like a security man sits back in his chair and he just flops onto the floor. You know, someone else is just lying and some people are helping him. He's sort of lying in the, you know, he's probably just on a bender, you know, he's on a night out. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just ridiculous, but people, people are just so far into this now, into the quagmire, so deep into the quagmire that there's, there's no point even showing them this stuff anymore because I think their minds have already been made up, which is a bit of a shame. But uh, I don't know if you have any comments on that. But I just thought that was quite funny, all those old Wuhan videos. Wuhan. Yeah, I, I have a few things to say on that. I mean, Wuhan has the worst air quality in China mm. and respiratory problems are rampant throughout the year. Um, it's not something new. Mm. Um, so I'd just like to point out, like when there's bad air quality, you get sick, you get sick. Like mm. I've been, I go to China, or I used to go to China about once a year. Mm. And, you know, you, you feel like stuffy nose, coughing, sneezing, just because the air quality is so horrible. Mm. Um, so that's something I want people to kind of understand, at least about Wuhan, that it's highly polluted. The second thing I kind of want to say about all of that is, it's why I started this whole study was like, okay, there's all this stuff out here, like people claiming to drop dead and all these respiratory issues. And I kind of went all the way back and said, well, what is the root of this? Like what is holding all of this together? And that is the alleged SARS-CoV-2 virus, right? Mm -hmm. So without the, this new novel alleged SARS-CoV-2 virus, they can do nothing. They have no justification for anything, mm. right? And that's when I looked at the science and I said, well, does the science support their claims? And obviously it doesn't. Like the science does not support that there's a new novel virus. Um, 
and you know they they sort of bend over backwards to try to make it work um the whole genetic sequencing thing of viruses like that's primarily done in computers and they just run their computer programs to generate a new sequence and there's there's hundreds and hundreds of new sequences from all around the world the virologists will claim it's all evolution of, of a virus but that's really strange to me uh, i think it's better explained that the parameters that people are using uh, and their computer programs are again non-deterministic, as I mentioned before. You put different, you put the same input in, and you get different outputs. Mm. So I think that's how they're able to create these virtual genomes. Wow. And what do you think about the effects of, let's say, radiation? You know, like the kind of upping of radiation with the five G. I mean, could that actually? I know a lot of people talk about that. I mean, it, could that have an effect on the body? Could that be creating the symptoms, some COVID symptoms, or not? So I think that we need to do long-term study on EMF radiation. Mm. Um, the big mobile providers in the States were, um, they had a, a, I think it's, sorry, they went to uh, Congress and Congress asked them, hey, have you done any long-term studies? Mm. And they said, no, we've done no long-term health studies. They just go by what the FCC says. And the FCC just looks at, um, does the radio waves heat the skin? Mm. That's all they're looking at. They're not looking at long-term exposure of EMF. So I think that that's, those studies need to be done, and they should be done before uh, deploying any new technology. Because how is it going to affect us in 10 years, 20 years? Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, I mean, you know, th things that we thought were pretty benign at the time have now turned out to be malign, you know, like cigarettes, you know, everyone had a cigarette, didn't they? Or um, asbestos or DDT and, um, you know, I'm sure there's heroin, you know, hydrochloride. These are all things that were pretty, um, you know, they were seen to be uh, benign, but later down the line, we've realized they were pretty, pretty bad, pretty toxic. So I don't see why that isn't, can't be the case now with uh, you know, some of the EMF radiation, especially the upping of it to 5G levels. Um, it, it's not that absurd to say that there could be a health issue with this, but I think if you mention that these days, that people equate you with a flat earther, you know, that I know that's something you, I hate that as well. You know, someone that's just curious and skeptical and worried and concerned about these big organizations that wanna like, you know, um, you know, maximize their profits and roll out certain things and, you know, create massive contracts, you know, maybe they don't have our best interest at heart. I mean, certainly McDonald's don't have our health at heart, but everyone eats it. And, you know, we know that for a fact and people can make the choice whether to go into a McDonald's or not. Yet they are the biggest, you know, one of the biggest fast food chains in the world. We know that Coca-Cola is not good for us, yet they are the biggest, uh, you know, soft drink, aren't they, in the world. So we know that there's, we know that a lot of these companies produce absolute shite and uh, you know we're t we're ingesting that into our bodies. So is it really absurd to say that there's other organisations that don't have our health at heart as well? I mean, that to me is pretty. That's a no-brainer to me. But um, a lot of people would say would would call you a flat earther just for even thinking that way. So that's uh, I don't know. That's just how <laughs> that's that's the difference between how some people think, isn't it? Um, yeah, I, I think I think we have to try to be like more like Martin Luther King Jr. You know, we have to try to show kindness. We have to show equality. Um, I think that's probably a way of converting people over mm. is to say, hey, look, you know, people on our side, like we just want to give you information. You know, we don't we don't want to cause you any harm. We care about one thing that we need to be clear on is we do care about people's health mm. like if we're questioning the whole science mm. we're not bad people mm. we care about people that are dying we care about people being sick and that's why we're asking because we actually want people to get better and healthier and in order to do that we need to find out what's causing them to be sick yeah. and it's clear by the science that the SARS-CoV-2 virus isn't is it doesn't exist so we know that doesn't cause the disease so we should be studying what is causing the disease and trying to make the world a better place for people to be healthy.
Mm. And I know for a fact that lowering pollution makes people healthier. Mm. So cleaning up our environment, mm. cleaning up our food, cleaning up our water sources is going to make healthier people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing that we, we are truth detectives. It's, uh, and I, I encourage everyone to do this. That's why I, was, I wanted to bring you on, Mike, is that um, it, it, despite the fact that you don't have a medical background, you are someone that's thought, I really want to look into this, you know, and why shouldn't I be able to look into this? And that's what I think everyone should do because it's a new paradigm now. Instead of saying, well, the government told me this or the Guardian newspaper told me this, so therefore it must be true. Everyone else is saying it's true, so I'll believe that. No, be your own journalist. You, everything's at your fingertips now. Like I can reach out to you. I can reach out to Stefan Lanker. I can reach out to Bruce Lipton, a cell biologist, and I can ask him to give me the information firsthand from the source, from people who have studied this. I don't need to have it like passed down to me third hand through um, you know, this, 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 uh, this column, this article that had gone through this filtering process from the senior editor. And then you know, that probably he has certain things that he has to work with to make sure that it's in line with their that you know their newspaper so you know that's the old way of doing things you know just listening to the box in the corner of the room or just you know going to your news agents and just reading just absorbing what's your what's put in front of you be your own sodding detective go out and find this information yourself you know that's how it should be and that's why i wanted to bring you on i also brought philip on who put together a presentation showing all this stuff because i want this to be an encouragement for people to um, this should be the way that we um, we source information, we procure information. And I think that you've put a very solid case forward there. And I would like to say, you know, maybe we're, maybe this is wrong. Maybe we're wrong. But, um, you know, please counter it. Please come back to us with uh, the response to all this. And then, you know, maybe we're wrong today and we'll be corrected tomorrow. And we'll say, you know, do you know what? I was wrong yesterday. I'm, you know, I'm right today. But this is how I think the line of inquiry should be. And I think we need to be brave. We need to be courageous in, in, in saying what we think to be true, uh, even if it upsets people, even if we, we risk um, you know, embarrassment or ridicule. That's okay. I'm, I'm ready. I'm willing to put myself in the firing line if it means you know, reaching the, the point of truth, you know, reaching that place of truth. And that's what you've done, Mike. And that's why I was really you know, glad that you came on. Thanks for putting that presentation together and all, all the hard work behind that. Thanks. I know it's like gone three in the morning there in New Zealand. So I really appreciate the fact that you stayed up late to, to come on the show with me. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people doing, doing good work like yourself and just putting out information. You know, what can be, what, what's the harm in that? You know, just putting out information. People can look at it. People can also, if you don't like this, you don't even have, you can, you can tune out. You can turn off if you want. But if you are interested and you do want to learn more, you know, be open-minded to check this out because uh you know before every paradigm shift those people were always the outsiders they were always the outliers um and uh, you know they were they were kind of ostracized in society and then they certain anomalies were found within that current paradigm uh people start to question it a little bit more and then there was a tipping point there was a threshold where it collapsed the old paradigm and the new one came in and then when everyone looked back on the old paradigm people went how the hell were we living in that you know paradigm so um we can't write anything off at this stage so uh, yeah just like to say thanks a lot mike um and uh, you know good luck with everything and hopefully we can speak at, at some point you know in the near future